A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. We are recording this on August 4th, 2021. And our guest today is Mike Cavaluzzi, a criminal defense attorney based here in Los Angeles, a friend of the show. Mike, welcome back. It's great to be back. Mike, I'm really glad that you're here today. I'm just so sorry that we have such hideous cases. I mean, this is like depravity central. It's just the worst, just the worst. So yeah, very sad cases today. They really are. And, you know, I always try when we when the team talks about putting the program together, I, I try to find hope inspiration and justice, especially for survivors of crime. And I got to tell you today, I can't find any of that. I can't find the justice. I can't find the hope. And and we do have, you know, a conviction at the at the end of the show. I mean, we, we've got a case with with an incredible conviction. But still, uh, I think as we will explain, survivors still don't feel justice. So let's get into the two cases, Mike. Uh, this is what we're looking at. A Milwaukee man has been sentenced to 205 years for killing five of his family members. It was horrific. And he admitted it from the very beginning. He even called 911 to tell them what he had done. But first, a Florida woman has been accused of keeping, we believe to be her child, we're going to discuss that, but a child with severe autism in a metal and wood cage. This is horrendous. I am so upset about this case. I've been thinking on it so much, trying to figure out how I feel about this and how I feel about this person. We'll discuss that. Let's get into the details, Mike. So on Saturday, July 24th, the Palm Bay Police Department gets a call about a girl who has climbed a fence over the backyard fence into a neighbor's backyard And the couple who live at that house called the police and said that the girl had not only scaled over the fence, but that she had now gotten into their enclosed screen porch. Police respond, and it is very apparent to the police officers that this girl and her age has not been released, is nonverbal, and um, is incapable of communicating and is of special needs. The girl came from the neighbor's property. The neighbor is 43 year old Melissa Doss. That is where she lives. So now the police realize they have a special needs girl. They go and they knock on the door from the home that she came from. And police say they see Melissa Doss, the the person who lives there, like coming out the back and police, you know, come around and and they talk to her. And obviously they had a lot of questions, a lot of questions for this woman. So this Melissa Doss tells police that she was unaware that the girl had gotten out of the house. She explains to the officers she has severe autism. The officers ask to go inside. They ask, and she says, no. So Mike, at this point, when you have a situation like this, because I guess they don't have a warrant, do police at this point have reason to say, wait a minute, what's going on here? Is this young person in danger? So there is an exception to having a valid judge signed a search warrant, which would be if there are exigent circumstances, meaning that there is the danger of imminent crime occurring inside the home, the police could gain entry that way. And it is interesting that the police didn't utilize that exception in this case. And it makes me wonder uh, what condition the girl was in first when they encountered her the first time, because the first time they seemed to bring her back to the home and leave. And then they return a second time when the girl apparently escapes a second time and goes back to the neighbors. It makes me curious as to what condition the girl was in, if she was what is commonly referred to as hygienically intact, meaning that she appeared to be 
uh, clean, clothed, and cared for. And perhaps that's why they didn't go inside. Or if the police simply didn't want to deal with the situation at hand and thought it might just be best to get the Department of Children and Family Services involved. Every state has their different name for that. In California, it's referred to as the Department of Children and Family Services. It could have a different acronym in Florida. But regardless, it's bringing in this separate agency whose job it is to evaluate homes. And when the agency comes in with a concern and there are minors in the home, um, citizens, I believe, are required to allow social workers into the home, not to search it, but simply to evaluate it. It's unclear what condition the girl was in because the police have not made that part public, along with it's unclear, the police will not say what the relationship is between this girl whose age we do not know, we do not know her name, and we do not know her relationship to Melissa. The police won't say, and several news agencies have reported that Melissa Doss is the mother of this child, along with two other siblings who were in the house. I suspect, we don't know, we don't have a description of what condition the girl was in. I'm going to suspect, as we get into this case, you know, there was no running water in this house. There was squalor. It was disgusting. The smell was horrible when police finally got entry. So I find it very hard to believe that this this girl would have been in in a proper sanitary condition and clean. It is possible. Yeah, I agree with I you. But I find it very unlikely. Yeah, given the condition of the home and, and the conditions she herself was living in within a cage, it seems very unlikely that she would have been um, in any way in sort of a healthy appearance. I mean, they literally said that she would have been safer sleeping outside than she was inside that home. That's how bad the condition was. Exactly. So it's unclear to us why the police then let the girl go back in that house. But as you said, they did return a few hours later because at 1130 that night, police get another call they return to the house because the girl has escaped again. Mike, this girl may not be able to talk, but she is clearly communicating that she wants out of here and she is running away from a situation that is horrendous. I think she is clearly communicating to all the adults in the room that she needs help. Yeah. There is no question. No question that she is capable of communicating that she is not safe. So when the officers return at 11.30 that night because the girl ran away again. I'm sorry, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, just, just, just really quickly. Um, and again, none of this excuses any of the behavior here. It seems really horrific. But if we do believe Melissa Doss at all, she does say that the reason why she was keeping the girl confined is because she was routinely escaping the house and Doss was fearful for her safety. So again, I think we need to learn more about the history, whether this girl, we don't know the severity of her autism. We don't know this, what her specific mental health condition was. We don't know if even before the home, we don't know if the home has always been in this condition or maybe before the home was in this condition, she was routinely escaping because of her autism. We, there's just a lot more information that we do need because Melissa Doss does tell the police that the reason why she was confined is because she was escaping the house so much and she feared for her safety. That could be a lie, that could be a poor excuse, but it is what she's saying and it needs to be investigated. Oh, it needs to be investigated. Yeah, you do not keep kids in cages. Yeah, and if you and if you cannot and you need help, then there are resources. You need help. Clearly, everybody in this house needed some help here. But but again, those resources become so critical because True. we need to look at what those resources are. Um, I would imagine that this young girl, if she is severely autistic should be on some sort of um, social security or, or, or some kind of state aid. 
And um, were people checking on the home routinely if she's receiving this aid? There, there's just so much that we don't know, again, about what the resources were that were available to DOS. Did she have any family support system? Where were the kids' fathers? Um, to what extent did she have access to help from the Department of Children and Family Services? All of those questions need to be answered. And did everyone just look the other way? That's right. They, I, they didn't want to see or they didn't want to deal with That's it. exactly right, that they didn't want to see. They don't want to see. They don't want to see. So when this is now, we're up to the second call to police in the same day. The girl has run away for the second time. Melissa Doss tells the officers that she is, quote, at the end of her rope. Okay, so if she is the mother or she is the adult supervisor in this case, she is now telling police, I can't anymore. And that should have been pretty obvious on the first 911 call. But I think at this point, police really start to um, to make a turn here in the investigation and do a few things that will change the course of everyone's life. Officers, again, ask her, please, Can we look inside the residence? She tells them no. She still is saying no, and they're not pushing. And she says, this is according to police, quote, if you saw the inside of my residence, DCF would take the child, DCF being the Department of Child and Family Services for Florida. That's a cry for help, though. That really is, because she clearly knows that that's exactly what they're going to do, is then to go to DCFS, and she's going to have her kids taken away. So she doesn't seem to be making an extraordinary attempt to hide the condition of the home or to keep her children in the home. It seems like that is a clear message that um, someone needs to get involved and she needs help. So instead of entering the property at this point, which I do believe police probably would have had a very good reason to enter. They instead contact the Department of Child and Family Services and they come back to the home. This is now a third time in less than 24 hours. By now it's 2.51 a.m. and it is now Sunday, July 25th. Police return with the Florida Department of Children and Families um, special like social worker and Melissa Doss allows them in. I don't think she had an option at this point. The the responding officers and the social worker find three children living in squalor. Yeah. The police, in their police report, which is highly redacted, so we do not know the ages of the children. Again, we don't know the relationships other than apparently the three kids are siblings. The police say, quote, the smell of urine and feces was overwhelming. Police say that there was trash, bugs of all kinds, spiders, flies scattered throughout the house. Not one bathroom worked. Not one bathroom. So they would use a bucket and then throw the waste in the backyard. So much junk everywhere. Police could not even see the floor. It was that bad. Additionally, there was mold everywhere, parts of the wall were damaged, and the roof was partially collapsed. No water, no running water. This thing is inhabitable, uninhabitable. And keep in mind, this is Florida in the heat, okay? So I don't even want to, I can't even go there. I cannot in my head even go there. And I'm sorry, but this does not sound like this is something that just happened over the last few weeks, okay? The investigator for Child Protective Services said that Melissa and one child shared a bed and that next to the bed was a homemade metal and wood cage. We're going to show you pictures of it, those of you who are watching on YouTube, those of you who are listening. Best description I can give you is think of an uh, an A-frame. The wood, you know, the two, two beams coming together making an A-frame, and then the metal cage is like a box, and it is surrounded by very thick, heavy chicken wire is the best way to describe it. It is not 
tiny in the sense that you can actually get into it. You could fit a bed in there. Apparently, depending on your size, you could stand up. Maybe a child could stand up in there. And that this cage was next to the bed. And that Melissa Doss said that she had to put the girl in the cage at night. Otherwise, she would run away. And that she would release the girl during the day because she would wake up in the morning and would be screaming. Of course, she would be screaming. She's in a cage. There was a blanket and a pillow in there. Police got most of this information, obviously, from the other siblings. They described how they all lived and how this girl was being treated. And one of the siblings told police and the social worker that, quote, mother shuts and traps the girl with autism in the cage at night to keep her, again, from running away. The ages and the names of the children have been redacted, so we really don't know much information here. I want to ask you something here, Mike. Why do you think that the police are being um, so tight-lipped or evasive about the relationship between Melissa Doss and this girl with autism? You know, it could be something as simple as they don't know as simple as they're exploring what the specific relationships were. Is she the biological mother? Is she somehow an adoptive mother? It could be something as simple as that or something a little more complicated in terms of wanting to make sure they have approval from family members about what they're allowed to say and what not to say. You know, any cases that involve minors, anyone under the age of 18, have very specific rules and laws and frameworks frameworks that protect kids. And it might be something having to do with that. The Palm Bay Police Department made a statement about this. The Lieutenant Jeffrey Spears told Florida Today, quote, the detective investigating the case said that it would have been better and more sanitary for the children to sleep outside than to stay in the home. No wonder she was trying to run away again. She was communicating. She needed help without question. So Doss is arrested at 530 in the morning on Sunday. So that means they took several hours in the house to investigate, talk to the other children and figure out the situation. She was charged with three counts of child neglect and one count of aggravated child abuse. On the 26th, Melissa Doss appeared before a judge. The charges were formally read against her in court and bond was set at $22,000. $22,000. Now, before we started uh, recording this program, you and I were talking and I said, you know, I would have made that $22 million and, and you wanted to talk about the bail. What about the bail? Because I certainly don't think it's enough. Yeah, well, um, bail is is a really interesting topic that's coming up now because there's a lot of there are a lot of bail reform laws throughout the United States trying to reform our, our bail system. It starts first and foremost with the presumption of innocence that regardless of what anyone is charged with or how serious the offense, they are presumed innocent. So bail cannot be focused on whether or not someone is guilty of a crime. Bail has to be focused on two things, whether the individual is a flight risk and whether they present a danger to the community. Um, Taking them one at a time, is Melissa Doss a flight risk? A flight risk. She seems impoverished, and for that, they will look to her ties to the community. How long has she lived either in that home or in the area? Is she a US citizen? Is she a permanent Florida resident? And they look at that to see whether or not she's a flight risk. And it seems from what we know that she probably is not. The second is, is she a danger to the community? And looking at whether or not she's a danger to the community, you again, don't look at how she treated either her own children or certainly the children who were under her care. And if those children are removed from her home, and she's placed in a controlled setting, perhaps on some kind of electronic or electronic monitoring or house arrest, then is she a danger to the community? And I think, again, the answer would probably be no. That if she, there are no kids in her care, um, she is probably not a danger to the community. And if she is a permanent resident of Florida, especially locally to that area, she's not a flight risk. And that's what bail has to focus on. So we can look at the conduct itself and think this is depraved, this is horrible, this is cruel, 
But what we really need to look at is if we're affording people the presumption of innocence, then we have to be very clinical about it and address those two factors. And it seems to me that the bail is appropriate when we consider those two factors. I'm feeling less clinical and more emotional, without (laughs) question. uh, Absolutely, and I get that. I'm honest about that. That's exactly how I feel. Uh, I am horrified at the condition that these children were living in, especially a child with special needs, especially. Now, I I said it before we started talking about this, how I've been trying to process this. I'm trying to figure out. I'm angry at, at Melissa Doss. I'm really angry with her. And at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, okay, she was living in this condition as well. Because we've seen cases where there are parents who live in the nice part of the house, right? Yeah. And then they treat their children as bad as this or worse. In this case, we have the adult in the house living in the same horrible conditions as the children. So while I do not have sympathy for her here, I am questioning whether it's possible that there could be some severe mental illness involved here as well. There, that- yeah, I think clearly there's some kind of underlying mental illness. And you know, this may not be a perfect comparison, but if you look at situations with hoarders and how often those are situations where even the, they're sane people who it becomes a slow spiral downward that it starts with something emotionally tumultuous or something traumatic happening to them which leads often a normal person to slowly go down this road where their home becomes completely inhabitable and a shambles around them And that's why I think we need to learn so much more. I do have sympathy for Melissa Doss. That's just where I start from is sympathy. I want to know more about how she got here. What were her circumstances? Um, What is her work situation? What is her poverty situation? Uh, What services have been afforded to her and she has denied or has she never sought services? I want to know more about her and her support structure and background. And I just want to know more about those children and make sure that they're safe. I, I, yeah. I hear you, Mike, and I, there's definitely a balance. You know, everything's got to be looked at. It's just such a horrific situation. And I think anyone who's a regular watcher or listener knows that when it comes to any form of crime against the most vulnerable is where I get extremely upset. Um, because those are the ones who we must always stand up and protect. So um, I hope that there is more information on this. I'm a little concerned that the news media in the immediate area are kind of doing what I feel everyone did from the beginning, kind of looking the other way. They don't want to really dig into this one, but I really think this deserves to be looked into. It yeah, really does. It, 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 it is an easy, easy answer and temptation to just divert our eyes from situations like this. Yeah, well, we're gonna try and keep tabs on it and figure out what in the world happened here. Yeah. Before we move on to our next case though, we have a quick word from our sponsor. There's a lot of pride that comes with owning a home and a lot of responsibility, maintenance, repairs, updates. Sometimes it can be a lot to take care of. Introducing Angie, previously known as Angie's List. Angie is your home for everything home, taking all the work your home needs and putting the solution right at your fingertips. With Angie, you can see upfront pricing on hundreds of projects, instantly book and pay, and connect with expert pros all in one place. Make your home an Angie home. Check out Angie.com today. Well, Mike, we go from one horrific case to another. Now we're moving on to Wisconsin. This is where a man has been sentenced to 205 years in prison for murdering five members of his family. According to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Christopher Stokes, is 44 years old, has pleaded guilty to five counts of intentional 
homicide. Now, more than a year ago, on April 27th of 2020, Christopher himself called 911 and told the dispatchers that he had killed his whole family. He said, quote, um, I just massacred my whole family. And he went on to say, the gun is still upstairs with the bodies. To me, this is incredibly interesting. Then there's, um, this is, okay, so the police arrive at the house and they see Christopher Stokes outside with a toddler. So police think that he's a surviving victim of the massacre because it's, you know, an adult whole, you know, with a baby, a toddler. So that's how they approach him to, are you okay? Is the gunman still inside? Here's the amazing thing. He was, is the shooter. So can you imagine for those few seconds where police actually, you know, treated him as a victim and then realize, oh dear Lord, he is indeed the shooter. It's, it's, it's stunning because the officers actually asked him, did you hear any of the shots? And he said, yeah, I didn't hear them. I did them. Yeah. Those are the quotes. Okay. So let's get into who was in the house and who was murdered. And then we're going to get into what happened in court because, um, it, this goes to justice, right? And what is justice and whether the survivors of those who were killed feel that they were just, and they're all related. That's the other thing. Everyone's related here. So let's get into the victims here. So, uh, he murdered his on again, off again, girlfriend, Teresa Thomas, who's 41. They shared a son, Demetrius Thomas, 15 and Teresa's daughter, Tira Agee, who is 16. Two others were also killed. Lathika Stokes, 17 years old, and Marcus Stokes, 18 years old. They were identified as his niece and his nephew. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reports that Christopher spared his three-year-old grandchild because the grandson reportedly asked him not to hurt him. So he spared the baby. The baby was there, witnessed everything. At three you are aware of what's going on, especially if you can say, please don't hurt me. Yeah. I can't even imagine the trauma that this child has suffered and how this child will be permanently affected by all this, besides the fact that his family was just massacred in front of his eyes. So, um, you know, he, he admitted again in the 911 call to police who arrived, he did a plea deal. He's never denied it. He's always owned it from the very beginning. Yes, I did this. But what has been missing from this is the why. Why did you do this? So I want to play a clip from sentencing because he has a chance to address the court and he describes and offers an apology, but really doesn't offer any answers. Here's a clip. I deserve everything I get. I'm not asking for no leniency or anything like that. I woke up and I just had blood on my mind. I can't see it no other way. So when I hear him say things like, I don't know what in the world came over me, woke up and just had blood on my mind. Who says things like that, Mike? Yeah, I know. It's crazy. But crazy is not the issue because clearly the court and his defense attorney wanted to make sure that when he entered into this plea deal, because he kept saying, yes, I did it. I did it. I did it. It's like, wait a minute. What is his mental capacity to make these decisions and enter into a plea deal? And they determined, no, did he, he is mentally fit. Did he have any criminal history, any history of yes. violence? Okay. Plenty of it. Okay. Yes. And we're going to get into that. He okay. had a criminal history. And we're also going to get into the fact that he had, that his attorney says he had asked for mental health services because he was starting to hear voices. And this was at the beginning of COVID, started to get help. Then because of COVID, the help 
became either telephonic or on video and virtual. Or maybe no even longer. unavailable. I mean, and maybe, because yeah. I know from the work that I do that a lot of uh, the kids that I represent um, who don't have a lot of resources were, were put on lines for treatment. We're, we're not getting any mental health treatment at all. And during a time when they needed it most. Right. You know, and right. so that might be his situation is that he may be completely of sound mind now on proper medication, but we don't know what the situation was like for him leading up to and at the beginning of the pandemic, because this happens in April of 2020. So it's about six weeks into this radical change in all of our lives and different people reacted differently. Again, not an excuse, but, you know, interesting timing of when this happened. Yes. Yes. And I do, I, I do appreciate when someone owns up to what they've done as opposed to the, I didn't do yeah, it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I just, it, that really turns my stomach. It is so interesting because obviously he commits such a horrific and unforgivable crime, but you have to have this small crumb of respect for him for coming forward and immediately admitting it was him because time after time after time, we see people who have committed unspeakable crimes who then put either their family or a victim's family through the torture of a trial in which they are fabricating um, a defense and insisting that they're innocent. And while he doesn't give answers as to why he did this, at least he has that small amount of dignity to admit that he did it. It's so interesting that you say that because even with his admission and sparing the extended family um, a trial where he denies everything, it did not relieve their pain. It may have shortened the experience of the trial, but clearly from what we saw, his, you know, because the family members get a right to address yeah. the court and his sister is yelling at him, yeah. say something, say something. You know, she just wants to hear from him. She needs an answer. Then you hear another family member who's sitting, you know, with the rest of the public and she starts screaming at him and she has to be removed from the courthouse. Uh, a sister of his afterwards is interviewed and, and says, I hate him. Yeah. I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. Do I love him because he's my brother? Yes. He is my brother, but I hate him for what he's done, what he has done to this family. So here you have the extended family suffering so tremendously because of the, the carnage, the number of people who have been killed, and the person who took all your loved ones away is another loved one. Yeah, yeah. So he didn't spare them. I mean, I know what you're saying. Yes, they didn't have to sit through a long trial and his denials. I get that. But it's amazing how... Well, I guess it's not amazing. The The pain is still the same. And yeah. I always say it goes back to justice. What is justice? Here the man gets 200 years in prison. The man admits to doing it, right? But yet no one feels any justice. Yeah, because there can't be justice in this sort of a profound loss. You just, I, I, don't, I don't know that there was an answer he could give them that would have given them any solace or peace. Because at the end of the day, it's a bloodbath. I mean, it's a person who clearly some switch flipped. And he, as he says, had blood on his mind and just loses it because there isn't, it doesn't feel like it's for revenge. It's not targeting the girlfriend and maybe her daughter or, or her kids because he's angry at her. He kills his own niece and nephew. Like, like there just doesn't feel like there's any rhyme or reason to what he's done other than somehow some switch turned onto red and he just lost it, followed some internal order to kill everyone in the house. 
And he, and he said it, these are his words, I did the ultimate sin, I deserve to be locked up, I deserve everything I get, I'm not asking for no leniency or yeah. anything like that, I deserve it. No one in the world should have done what I did. Yeah. But but yet hearing those words, it, it's like it almost infuriates you more because you're hearing someone who clearly yeah. knows right from wrong. Well, yeah, and it's like that repeated word that his own family members are using, which is why, why, why it just becomes, you know, you just repeat it in your head and the family will so sadly be torturing themselves with that question for the rest of their lives is really why. Why would anyone do this, you know? Yeah, and the judge, Michelle Havas sentenced Christopher to 40 years for each victim, plus another five years for the illegal possession of a gun because he was a convicted felon. So that's how they came up with 205 years. And as I said, they tried to determine before sentencing, was there any mental illness, any defect or anything like that, that could have played a role in this or made it uh, impossible for him to enter this plea deal. But after two doctor's evaluations, they found that Christopher was fit to stand trial and could make these decisions. You asked about... Well, I, I do want yeah. to speak to that for, for one moment, because there okay. are two separate things that have to do with mental illness or fitness um, in, a, in a criminal defense case. Um, one is, was the person of sound mind when they committed the offense? And are they of sound mind now to go through the criminal proceedings? Um, it seems that whatever mental health issues he was having, he was not so degraded as to not understand the difference between right and wrong. But if it's true that he was hearing voices and seeking some kind of help, that's there still might have been an underlying mental health condition. Separate from that, you need to look at his condition during the criminal process. If an individual perhaps was sane when they committed a crime, but by the time that they're going through the process, they have deteriorated to such an extent that they don't understand the proceedings and are unable to assist in their defense, can't communicate with their lawyer, then they are not fit to stand trial. And they are generally sent to a mental health facility until they are their sanity is restored and then they come back. In this case, because for him to enter a plea, for him to for them to resolve the case, they need to make sure that he is mentally fit and able to make those types of decisions to understand his defenses, to understand his constitutional rights, and to understand the, con the consequences of his plea. And he clearly was mentally fit now. That doesn't necessarily speak to what exactly his mental health was at the time that he committed the offense, other than that he was probably able to determine between right and wrong, which is the foundational question uh, for someone to be sane for purposes of criminal prosecution. I think so. Uh, his attorney said that in March of 2020, which would have been a month before the massacre, that he started to receive some mental health support. And his defense attorney says that Christopher allegedly was hearing voices and that he was in counseling sessions, but they were canceled in favor of phone only communication due to the COVID restrictions. And as, as you said, that, that could very well have, you know, that little lifeline, Yeah, that little lifeline could have maybe, maybe, maybe averted this. I don't know. It's hard to say, it's hard to say, but clearly he there was something going on. And you asked about his criminal history. And in 2002, uh, he was uh, convicted of a misdemeanor battery and sentenced to probation and ordered to attend domestic abuse counseling. And he was prohibited from having firearms. Then fast forward five years later to 2007, 2007 he pleaded guilty to felony battery this time. So he went from a misdemeanor to felony and bail jumping and intimidation of a witness. He was sentenced to four and a half years in prison. Again, no firearms. Then in 2012, he pleaded guilty to another misdemeanor battery with domestic abuse modifier. And that was another 18 months 
behind prison. And then in 2017, we have him pleading guilty again to another misdemeanor, this one disorderly conduct with a month in jail. So this is a guy since 2002 who's been in and out of prison. Yeah. And also um, the domestic violence part of it speaks volumes to me because I consider this last horrific case to be domestic violence. He's killing his on and off again girlfriend and he's killing his own children and he's killing relatives. That's domestic violence. And there's a real strong history of domestic violence because I would hazard a guess that the felony battery is a domestic violence case because often when a felony battery is um, connected to an intimidation of a witness, the witness being intimidated is a family member. And in this, Mm -hmm. because that's who you have access to. So often when you see those two crimes together, it's because it's domestic violence. And the reason why it might not have had a domestic violence modifier is because somebody is sentenced to probation and counseling and all of those bells and whistles when they get probation. If someone goes to state prison, all the judge does is transfer them to state prison and it makes no other orders. So they might not put that domestic violence modifier on there because he's not getting those programs. Uh, but I would bet that the two, 2008 case, did you say? Um, 2007. The felony? Yeah, yeah, the 2000, 2007 felony, felony, yes. Yeah, I would bet that that is a domestic violence case for sure. Yeah, that's the one with the uh, intimidation yeah. of a witness. Yeah, because he's probably intimidating either a girlfriend, perhaps the same victim who he ended <sighs> up killing. And that says a lot about what maybe led to this, that that he has these under, uh, underlying issues with violence and perhaps violence against women. And that then explodes into this horrible event, you know, because I think three of the victims here were women. Mm-hmm. A very sad case a case in which he will be in prison for the rest of his life. He apologized, he owned up to it, and the conclusion is the same, a horrific tragedy. Yeah. Well, it is time for our comments section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about, and our Owen Michael is here now. Owen, please, please. Every every case we've discussed so far is so very dark. Tell us something not so dark. Got some stuff on the lighter side here. Hi, Anna. Hi, Mike. Uh, good to see you. Good to hear from you. Um, we do get comments across our, uh, our site and our our social media. Please stop by and weigh in. Um, this week, we've got a Louisiana man still wearing his tuxedo was arrested on his wedding night this weekend for allegedly shooting a friend of his new wife who was riding in their limousine with them. They were stuck in a traffic jam on the highway outside New Orleans when Devin Jones allegedly chased the other man out of the limo and shot him in the leg. The bride took refuge in a nearby ambulance. Jones was reportedly concerned about a possible romantic relationship between the friend and his new wife. Cynthia M said, who brings a weapon to his own wedding? (laughs) It's Louisiana for heaven's sakes. (laughs) (laughs) Having not been married, uh, yeah, I can't say what the the protocol is there. It seems unusual. Uh, Alexis S says, I mean, I've heard of shotgun weddings, but never uh, shoot the guest wedding. And Latrice H says, uh, damn, that's one hell of a honeymoon. Yeah, we might have some marital problems uh, going forward. Uh, we'll try to keep an eye on that one. On our oh next one, we've got- But uh, you know what? The fact that he shot him in the leg, I think he wasn't trying to kill him. Mike, what do you think? Well, I, I agree, but you know, people do die from gunshots to the leg. So you yes. know, for yes. all, of, all of the audience out there that's listening, Please don't think that shooting don't somebody shoot in an arm or a leg right, is right, going right. to somehow. <laughs> no, I'm not them. giving any advice here. I'm just saying that, you know, he shot him in the leg. Yes, I agree. I mean, who can say? Maybe he was just a bad shot. Uh, you know, that's, when that's true, too. Now, that's right. Are, uh, that's true, right. too. You never know. Uh, for our next one, we've got uh, something out of Oklahoma. We've got uh, Tulsa police posted on Facebook last month asking for the public's help locating a woman who was wanted on an accessory charge. Quotes, shortly after that, Lorraine Graves started commenting on our post asking about reward money, Tulsa police said. They traced the post back to Lorraine Graves. That was the suspect that they were looking for, and she was arrested the next day. Danielle C. said uh, she just wanted to know how much she's worth. (laughs) Validation. (laughs) You know, put put a dollar amount on it. Uh, Joe L. said, you can't blame a girl for trying, people. And uh, Bertha J. said, well, did she get the reward? That's what everybody Does wants she? to know. I, yes, I want to know. Mike, 
Does she get the reward? <laughs> I don't think you get the reward for turning yourself in. But at the end of the day, the, the police got what they wanted. So maybe she should get the reward. Maybe this is a, a law enforcement practice that they need to uh, sort of, institute, you know, like you can keep yeah. your own reward yeah, money. Yeah, exactly. You're cutting out the middle man. Right. <laughs> Just turn yourself in and we'll give you the money. It's worth it. Uh, I like that okay. proposal. Thank you, Owen. We needed something a little bit lighter today. <laughs> see you guys next week. Yeah, see you next see, week. See you next time. Well, that is our episode for this week. Mike, thank you so much. You know, every time you come on the show, and I love everyone who comes on the program, obviously, <laughs> but you, what you always remind me of with your commentary is your kindness and your oh, compassion you. toward all human beings who are vulnerable, including those who do heinous things. And I, I, I really thank you for that kindness and compassion that you have for well, people. It really reminds so me and puts me in my place. It's a necessary part of my work. So it, it's, a, it's a muscle I've developed, I'll say that much, because it doesn't come easily to have sympathy for people who engage in the kind of conduct we talk about, so. Thank you for that. Thank you. And uh, okay. And I want to start doing something um, at the end of the program. I want to ask people like what crime shows like you watch or or do you like to watch okay. true crime? I'm always curious. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I make my living with crime and I also spend my leisure time watching crime. I actually am addicted to Dateline and 2020 and 48 Hours, the real old standard bearers of true crime. Really? I love all three of them. I watch them weekly, even during the repeats. I rewatch them. So I watch those a lot. I, you know, I watch IDTV and some of those true crime shows. I love true crime documentaries. Um, I just have tons to recommend from Dirty John to uh, obviously things that are so well known like Tiger King and Making a Murderer. I just watch those over and over. Uh, but I always like also like really light stuff. I'll binge watch sitcoms and watch I Love Lucy episodes over and over and over again. So I'm oh all over God. the place. You um, are. That's <laughs> so interesting, Mike. You know, I do not watch any true crime documentaries or any of the Datelines. I try not to watch that because I feel like that is an extension of my work and I need a break from it. So I try not to watch those programs. It's really funny that way. Yeah, I'm just fascinated by um, the extreme limits of human behavior, whether it has mm -hmm. to do with these tragic crimes that we see where people are are murdering other people, but also shows about elaborate cons, about people who are living double lives, about all of that stuff. I just find it fascinating, sort of extreme behavior like that. It just, it's always interested me. Wow, so. but I do, I do like British detective shows. I love everything out of the UK. I'll watch that like, you know, over and over again. My lat, the one I just finished the other night is Line of Duty, highly recommended. BBC, it takes place in Ireland. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Okay, that's it for this week. Mike, where All can right. we find you if people want someone as kind hearted as you to help them and represent them? <laughs> well, the easiest way is to go to cavaluzzi.com. That's just my last name, C A V A L L U Z Z I.com. Or if you just Google my name, Mike Cavaluzzi, all kinds of fun stuff pops up. So that's how you find me. Okay, you can find me at Anna G News everywhere, and you can find our content on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. Of course, you can watch on YouTube and get updates by subscribing to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. Until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs>